Well, it's awesome to have you here with us this morning. That's just what we want to do. We want to turn our attention to the Son. We want to worship Him for everything that He's done for us. Let's show our thanks to Him as we sing together. promises we have through you, for the victory that we have through you, God. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. The Savior knelt to wash out. Now at his feet we bow The one who wore our sin and shame Now robed in majesty The radiance of perfect love 
fear? Who or what do you fear? You know, uh, I find some fears are irrational. Uh, we commonly call those phobias. <laughs> we're afraid of spiders, but we never see a spider. Uh, we're afraid of snakes when most of the snakes are not venomous. Uh, but fear is a real thing. It causes our heart to race. It causes our blood pressure to go up. It causes us maybe to get clammy or, or even start sweating. A fight or flight response is triggered in us. We have fears. And then there are the bigger fears, maybe. Fear of not having enough financial resource, of being poor. The fear of not being well. The fear of being an outcast, being socially unpopular. All of those fears are real for us. But I would suggest maybe that we don't fear the right thing. Another way of talking about and thinking about our fears is who is it we're trying to please? If we fear social repercussions, we're trying to please the people around us. If we fear somehow not achieving enough material wealth, we're, we're fearing not fitting in, not being respected, not being admired by those around us. You know, the Bible talks about fear a lot. And over 300 verses talk about the fear of the Lord. You maybe have never heard a sermon on the fear of the Lord. Uh, preachers tend to re- stay away from it, even though it's a common topic. Three, over 300 verses. In our study of 1 Peter, we are at a section of 1 Peter that talks about the fear of the Lord. And I want you to hear first... The fear of the Lord can be life-changing, transforming if you can grow in it. In other words, it is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly represented in the Scriptures as positive, not negative. And it revolves around that question of who you're trying to please. If we have a proper respect, a proper reference, a proper fear of God, then we live our lives, we make our choices, our values and our priorities become to please God first. And most. And that's what we want to think about today. That's what we want to talk about today. I've got three questions for us to understand this topic, this subject of the fear of the Lord. First, what are the benefits of the fear of the Lord? I'm just going to give you a survey. I could turn to a lot of verses, but it first tells us these verses that it's the key to long life, wisdom, and prosperity. You think about it. If you make choices to please God, then that's going to help your health. It's going to help you. If you choose not to drink, if you choose not to smoke, if you choose not to defile this temple that God has given you, it's going to help you with long-term health benefits. You learn to think about and understand the, the values of God and put those into place in your life. It's going to help you. Now, Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We all want to be wise. wise. Wisdom is taking the knowledge that we have of what's right and wrong, what's most important, and then putting it into practice. That's wisdom. It begins with the fear of the Lord. Secondly, Proverbs 8.13 says, To fear the Lord is to hate evil. That is, if you want to put God first, if you hold God in that rightful, most weighty place, then you see what he despises as bad, as something you don't want to be, something you want to be a part of, and you, all, you want to be a part of what is good. And then this proverb takes the first person voice of God in saying, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. What kind of world would it be to live in? It would be so amazing. To be in a world where there's no evil or pride or arrogance or evil behavior or perverse speech. If everyone feared the Lord, that's what it would be. Of course, we're not there yet. This world is not God's world. Proverbs 14, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. I think of uh, how every time we make a choice to do something God doesn't want us to do, how it brings about death in our life. We typically think of death as being when we breathe our last breath, physical death. 
But I'm telling you, when the Bible says the wages of sin is death, that every sinful choice we make brings a little death into our life. And if we make enough of them, it destroys our relationship with our girlfriend or our boyfriend, with our wife or our husband, our sons or our daughters, our moms or our dads. What this says is if we have the fear of the Lord, then it's going to benefit our life. It's going to turn us away from the snares of death. And then Proverbs 22, 4, humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches, honor, and life. The wages of sin are death. The wages of pleasing God, what you receive from pleasing God, are long life and health and prosperity. That's what we want to focus on. I also would say this about the fear of the Lord. It's the most important quality for us to pass on. It's the most important quality for kids, the kids in our life to see. If you're a grandparent, you're an uncle, you're an aunt, you're a parent, it's the most important because kids, they very much see what you think is important, what your values are, what your priorities are. You can talk to them all you want about what you believe is important and valuable, but they see it far more than they listen to what you say about it. Proverbs 14, 26 says, Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The world today is lacking security. I think the root of a lot of folks' problems, maybe even you, is insecurity. It's not knowing how we should live. It's not knowing what the next step is. It's not knowing what career choice to make. It's not knowing what actions to take. Insecurity leads to a lot of coping mechanisms. It leads to a lot of, let's be frank, just bad choices because we're trying to prove ourselves. We're trying to maybe please people that we shouldn't be trying to please. We're trying to, to fit in and get ahead in the world, so we take those moral shortcuts because of our insecurity. What this word is saying is if we make it our goal, our focus is to please God, then he brings a sense of identity. He brings a sense of confidence. He brings a sense of security. We, we can trust he is a secure fortress. And even more, it will help us to create a secure environment, a, a well-valued, well-prioritized environment for those kids in our life. It's important for us to know the truth and to know and hear the values of God and for us to pass those on. Our witness, what you find and think most important, most of priority. The people around you can tell you what that is, no matter what you say. Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, love, where we go? <laughs> love the Lord. You got my verse? All right, let's turn to it. Deuteronomy Chapter 6, and you'll just have to listen. <clears throat> 6, verse 5 says, uh, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Etch them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses, on your gates. How you choose to live, you want to talk about that with your kids and even more show them by the way that you're living. If you want to please God, if you fear God, you have the fear of the Lord in you, then that's going to be evident to your kids. It's going to produce for them a sense of security and well-being. I want you to think about it. If you hear somebody's God-fearing, do you have a positive or negative reaction? It's most likely positive. I can tell you, Scripture is full of examples of how fearing God is a positive rather than a negative. For example, in Genesis 42, 18, Joseph wins his brother's trust when he declares he is a God-fearing man. It was because the midwives feared God that they obeyed him instead of the authorities by sparing the Hebrew babies. Pharaoh brought disaster on his nation because he did not fear God. Moses chose leaders to help him on the basis that they feared God 
and wouldn't take bribes. Wouldn't it be awesome if all the politicians most feared God? Moses, he, he, he chose these leaders and he told the Hebrews that God met with them in a terrifying display of his power so that they wouldn't sin. The Mosaic Law cites fear of God as a reason to treat the disabled and the elderly well. As we fear God, we then treat others differently, better, more like we would want to be treated. Unless you think it's only an Old Testament idea, Jesus ups this teaching. He says it even stronger when he says in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot kill, touch your soul. In other words, don't be afraid of bodily harm here. Fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Paul says to work toward complete holiness because we fear God. So we can tell from these passages, hear me, that fearing God is good because it saves us from caving into our own sinful nature. It saves us from ourselves. That's why hearing someone as God-fearing actually makes us trust that person more. If they fear God, they're most likely to keep their word. They're far more likely to be kind and respectful, good and gentle. They are going to treat others in a way because they hear and know God's teaching. They know God's values. They know God's heart. And they want to have God's heart for his other creation. In Romans 3, a classic chapter on sin, it says that our chief sin is often that we have no fear of God at all. In other words, not having the fear of God leads us to continue making those self-destructive, rebellious choices to sin. So having understand all that, how do we fear the Lord? That's the second question I have for you. How do we fear the Lord? The first thing I would say to you is we consistently love and respect God. We consistently Love and respect God. I think those things go together. They must both be together. If we have a fear of the Lord, that means we consistently want to give him the credit. We want to give him the weight. We hold him with high esteem, with high honor. And we love him. And you think about that. That without any respect, there is no love. Think about that in dating relationships. Someone says they love you, but they don't respect you. It's probably not love. They must go together. Where there is respect and there is no, there is no love, there is cringing fear. And maybe that's why we pull back and talking about and thinking about the fear of God, is we think of it as that God is this mean God that's watching every step and he just wants to zap us. He just wants to, to cause, uh, make us be terrified. And that's not it at all. The Bible tells us from the beginning that God loves us. God loves you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed in him might not perish but have everlasting God, life. Love and respect go together. Whether there is no respect, but just love, uh, there's ir irreverent flippancy. It's both the balance that's needed. So we consistently love and respect God. That leads me to say this, that we consistently choose to obey God. If you want me to define the fear of the Lord, this is it. This is my definition. We consist If you fear God, you consistently choose to obey God because you love him and you want to please him. Now you think about that. I think about that with my parents. You could say in the language that I'm using today that I feared my parents. I can tell you this, I sure feared disappointing them. I feared letting them down. So I had my rebellious moments, but most of the time I chose to obey them because I love them and wanted to please them. If you think of the fear of God that way, it makes total sense, doesn't it? Then it starts making verses like 1 John 4.18 make sense. 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out fear. In the book of 1 Timothy, it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, of self-control. In other words, God doesn't want you to live your life insecurely 
always fearful if you have one person that you're trying to please. You and I, we should only have one fear. That's to let God down. It's to fear God. So I hope that's making more sense. And you start to see that the way the scriptures talk about the fear of the Lord, it's a good thing. The fear of the Lord is not the opposite of love. It's what real love is all about. A healthy sense of fear can be a positive motivation for doing right. This sort of loving respect is the basis of our relationship with God. It must be the basis of our relationship with God. When I choose to fear the Lord, I'm choosing out of respect and love to do the things that please Him. Hear me again. When I choose to fear the Lord, I'm choosing out of respect and love to do the things that please Him. All that I do in my life, it comes back to this principle. It's the foundation. The fear of the Lord is thus the most positive attitude that you can have toward God. So, why should we fear the Lord? Last week I talked to you about being holy. That's the subject of verses 13 through 16. And there must be motivation for us to live to make those holy choices. I think it comes out of this fear of God, this love and respect that you have for God, that you don't want to disappoint Him, that you want to please Him. Why should we live for God? Why should we live holy lives? Why should we fear the Lord? First, life is short. Life is short. <clears throat> Verse 1 of 1 Peter 1, a Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are all in modern-day Turkey. He's writing to Christians in modern-day Turkey. The, uh, the word I want you to focus on is commonly translated strangers or foreigners, the exiles. What he's saying, and he uses this as a theme throughout the letter of 1 Peter, is when you become a Christian, you realize that this world is not all there is. In fact, in this world, you're an alien and you're a stranger. You, you don't have, as you are transformed by Christ, you don't have the same values. You don't have the same desires anymore. That this world's not your home. You're passing through. And he takes that up in verse 17. Live out your time, your time, your, your short time, as foreigners here in reverent fear. That's live out your lives fearing God, respecting God, loving God. Life is short, the scripture tells us over and over. Psalm 90, 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And James 4, 14 says, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. What I take all that to say is, don't put it off. <laughs> don't think that one day you'll fear God. Don't think that one day you'll start making those choices that please God because you love Him and respect Him. Start today because life is short. We don't want to waste a moment of it because we are accountable. Second reason is we're accountable. The first part of verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially. He doesn't play favorites. He sees what we do, both the negative and the positive. Uh, often when we talk about judgment, we just think about the negative, but there's also positive as well. And then in verse 18, he says, For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you're redeemed. And here's the phrase I want you to see from the empty way of life. If you make those empty choices, you'll get those empty results. Oh, they might feel good right now. You might benefit a little financially right now. You might benefit a little uh, of popularity right now, but they it, virtually we seen for what they are. They will be seen as shams, the, the things that don't last. Hebrews eleven six says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must believe that He exists and that He rewards. As I say, they're positive, positive benefits, positive consequences. Uh, to living the life of faith, to living a life of fearing God uh, first and most. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 3, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly woods, stone, basically what he's saying is, 
if you're trying to play it both ways. You're trying to say, I'm a Christian, but, but yet I'm going to build up a, a worldly empire. I'm going to build up a life full of material resources. I'm going to build up a life full of power and prestige and, and worldly position. If that becomes what's most important to me, then their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. That is, when Jesus comes back, the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. In other words, if, and understand, this is not about salvation. You'll see it here in this next part of the verse. When you become a Christian, it's by faith. It's not by your works. But as God comes to life in your life, as Jesus comes to life in your, in your life, then you, your life should change what you produce uh, the things that you show matter and you build on, they are different. Those things will stand. Those things will be looked upon with favor by God. But if you build your life and you focus on worldly things, then what happens? If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though there's only one escaping through the flames. In other words, if our eternity, if our destiny is eternity, then we need to be building up eternal treasures the bible says every time that we honor god we're kind we're loving we bless others that we get stars in our crown god's an equal opportunity judge if we make choices that are selfish and self-centered that are sinful we'll be accountable for those but if we make choices that are god-centered we make choices that are God-pleasing and blessing and serving others, then he sees those things too. We're accountable. It's a vital reason to this day start to be all in for loving and respecting God, for pleasing God. And then, finally but not least at all, our freedom is precious. Most of this passage is devoted to talking about what we have with Christ that we would be missing. And I want you to hear that. It is so easy for us when we've been Christians for a while or been around Christian people and heard Christian teaching for us to take what is amazing, what we cannot put in words and we cannot put a price on to take it for granted. He says in verse 18, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. Redeemed is a price paid to give a slave his freedom I have in my wallet oh 130 dollars that was a good week um having my this 130 dollars and let's say i i, I, I multiply it by 10 1300 dollars or a hundred or a thousand or ten thousand would that be enough to buy my forgiveness? Would it not be enough to buy yours? So often we think in worldly terms because we live in an ungodly world. But what he's saying is this, this privilege that you have, this freedom that you have, this ability to change your life from empty to full, from a life that just benefits you to a life that blesses others. This privilege is precious. You are redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Uh, through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and your hope are in God. Friends, we don't realize we take for granted how amazing it is that the most holy, the most powerful, the most loving, the creator, the maker, the sustainer, the provider, the protector, God wants a relationship with me and you. And to make that happen, his son gave his life so that we could be forgiven and set free. You can't put that in dollar terms. You can't put it in terms of carats of gold and silver. It is truly a blessing. It is truly out of love 
that God gives you ability to have a relationship with him. I had the privilege of speaking in chapel at Central Christian College of the Bible, talking to a lot of folks that are getting their education to go into ministry or to be missionaries. And I told them this thing they really need to hear. And I think all of us need to hear it. So easy to get blasé. It's so easy to, to take for granted the privilege of knowing God. It is so easy to learn to not really respect God, not really think about God, not really give Him the place that He deserves. And what happens is that slips into our life. It's a very, very dangerous place to be a professional Christian. It's a very dangerous place for your spirit, for your soul, to be where you on the outside are talking all the right stuff. And on the inside, you're rotting and corrupting from within. And let me tell you how you can vaccinate yourself. What I've learned to do every morning, every morning. Now, it's not first thing in the morning because I'm not a morning person. But every morning, I think about and pray these words from Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4 is a scene of the throne room of God. And it's this amazing scene. Movie makers should make this scene. It is awesome. It's almost mind-blowing. There's these four living creatures. They're huge. They have eyes all around them. And one has the face of an ox and one a lion. And I mean, you read about it. But what amazes me is these creatures are flying around and they never stop saying day or night. They never stop realizing. They never stop being conscious of the fact that holy Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Let me say to you, if you think about that, if you focus on that fact, you will fear God. You will love God. You will respect God. You will not let your Christian life become routine. And the best thing about it if you live your life focused on the holiness of God, if you live your life living as a God-fearing man or woman, you are going to make such an amazing and positive difference in the people's lives around you. You're going to be an amazing proponent of the kingdom of God. That's why this is so important. We are terrible if we neglect to talk about the fear of God because the fear of God can change the world starting with me and starting with you never forget that he is holy and yet he loves you Father as we think about these things I'm humbled I'm challenged I'm convicted I think maybe all of us are there. It's so easy to slip into everyday life and just take for granted these amazing privileges. But Father, I, I pray today that this week we will consistently choose to love and respect you. We'll consistently choose to obey you because we love you and we want to please you. Help us to change what needs to be changed. We hold you in awe. We're not worthy. But yet you are patient and kind. And you love us. And you want us to walk with you. So help us to walk. In Jesus' name. Amen. It's ministry time. If you want to become a Christian, we can help you with that. If you want to join our church formally, then we can help you with that. But the challenge is for all of us, what's God trying to teach you about your life, about the values and priorities you should have, the way you should live, what changes need to be made. Let's stand and sing. If you have a public decision, please come.
on October 31st from 5.30 to 7.30, we have planned an awesome Fall Family Fun Fest. We have several inflatables, games for the kids, and a chili cook-off with prizes for best overall, most unique, and hottest. And lots and lots of candy. We are asking our church family to help by bringing two bags of candy to the event and signing up for a 30 minute time slot to help. Check your email or stop by the Connection Center to sign up, then head home to get your best recipe ready for the chili cook-off. We're excited for the opportunity we have to serve those in our community. One of those is the Nehemiah Feeding Project that provides meals each evening to those in need. You can volunteer your time by stopping by the Connection Center and signing up for an evening to go help serve those meals. Or you can pick up a list that has a few items that they are in need of right now. You can go purchase those and drop them off here at the Connection Center on Sunday. We also have Project Community Connect coming up. This is an event that connects underserved individuals to vital services they need to move their lives forward. This is on November 1st at the University of Central Missouri. You can find more information about how you can serve and volunteer by stopping by the Connection Center. Operation Christmas Child has been sharing Jesus' love around the world for 26 years. Help Northside partner with Samaritan's Purse by picking up a shoebox to fill with gift items for a child today. We have 300 boxes located in the kids' corner with information inside on how to pack the shoebox. Please return the shoebox by November 17th. On November 1st, the high school students will be heading down to Joplin, Missouri to attend the event at Ozark Christian College. This will be an amazing weekend of worship, learning, growing, and of course fun. We'll be staying overnight at the Ozark dorms and having a fun activity night at Victory Ministries. The cost for the event is going to be $45 if you sign up before October 30th. For more information and to reserve your spot today, please come by the Connection Center. I hope to see you there. Hey parents, we are hosting a baby dedication on Sunday, November 10th. This is an opportunity for you to commit to raise your child to know and love Jesus. There is a required class for you to attend on November the 3rd, so be sure to stop by the Connection Center to sign up. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of new people joining us. If you know these folks, welcome them. I'll tell you, this list is already old. Uh, we had another baptism last night and this morning. Uh, we recognized three guys that had completed a real-life discipleship. Uh, they are trying to put their lives back together. Uh, and, you know, I, I found oftentimes that, that it's when we're broken uh, that then God can, can truly uh, change us and bless us, and, and we need to be broken. Uh, I will tell you this. We had a young lady come today who is, again, trying to put her life, and she uh, rededicated her life to Christ. I don't talk about that often as one of the choices of, for a public decision, but if you ever move to do that, you can do that. You can rededicate yourself. I'll pray with you, and we will pray with you. We'll pray for you. Uh, we want to be a, a body that supports all of us being transformed, and uh, we need others to be praying for us, others to be accountable to. And so I want to share those things with you, and uh, just thank you for being here, and uh, I ask you to let God work in you, and you'll be, you'll be so thankful you did. Uh, sometimes we need to break down the walls of being uh, socially, uh, outwardly successful for God to do His work in us. Uh, let's stand. I'm going to pray for us. When I say the amen, we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you.